My topic tonight is uh, desperate prayer, the place for desperate prayer in seeking for transformation to happen in our communities. There are many, many types of prayer, and uh, we could have the petition prayer, the seeking prayer, and all other types of prayer. But we want to talk about desperate prayer tonight, why desperate prayer is necessary, and what can cause or hinder desperate prayer. Talking about desperate prayer, I'm reminded of a meeting I, I, I attended in Florida. It was a prayer conference, and uh, different speakers came up, and one speaker got on the platform and said, please go with me to the book of Second Chronicles 7.14. And as everybody was opening their Bibles, the lady who was seated next to me said, I hate that scripture. And I turned around and looked at her and said, what did you say? I said, I hate it. So I realized this, there was some stuff here. I didn't want to open a door too. I just continued focusing on the preacher. But later on, we met in the lobby of the hotel with this lady and began to talk. And I managed to secure some of her time. We sat down together and I said, you made a remark that stayed on my mind. You said you hated that scripture. She said, of course, I don't mean I hate the word of God, but I hate the way speakers and preachers use that scripture to talk about prayer. I said, go on, tell me what exactly do you mean. She says, everybody who wants to encourage people to pray goes to Second Chronicles 7.14 and promises all these good things God is going to do, heal the land and change society. If only we will humble ourselves, pray and seek his face, forsake our wicked ways. So we, we went on like that and it, it, uh, it emerged that she was not against the word of God or the scripture, but she felt bitter with the way it was used and preached and many promises made that God is going to answer if we only do A, B, C, D. Anyway, I wasn't able to convince her out of that position. But after Florida, I went down to Colombia, Bogota, where I was due to speak in a number of meetings. And I was talking about the power of prayer, the faithfulness of God in answering prayer, and the ability of God to change society if only we will trust him and seek him. And after one session, an old man came to me and patted my back and said, Son, I love your zeal and passion. I love the enthusiasm with which you share the word. And I want to say, keep it up. Don't, don't ever lose it. But allow me to ask you one thing. I said, yeah. He said, don't raise their faith too high. And I said, explain that to me. And he said, look, if their faith goes up too high and their expectation becomes so stimulated and then it doesn't happen, then it will really destroy the little they had there. It's better to remain where they are than to be raised so high only to come down and just be broken. And I said, but why wouldn't it happen? Why wouldn't God do what he promised to do? And he said, son, look at me. I have prayed for revival for more than 30 years. It's coming almost to 40 years. We have prayed in every conceivable way. We have fasted. We have claimed promises. And we have come to mature in our understanding. We have come to understand that God is sovereign. God will do what he wants to do when he wants to do it to the people he wants to do it to. In other words, we cannot twist the arm of God simply because we pray so much. We've got to pray, believe that we have received, and lay down. And I said, well, I, I, I don't argue with that. Why should it be difficult to, for you to, take, to accept the position that I take? He said, I believe God has answered heard our prayers for revival and he is going to give revival he's going to pour out his holy spirit when i don't know maybe it will be to my children maybe my children's children maybe their grandchildren 
I don't know when. God is sovereign. He will do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. It's up to him. We cannot force him by praying so much or believing so much. Well, that sounded humble and honored God. And I accepted it. I received it in my spirit. I thanked him, except that I lost my peace. I lost my confidence. I was supposed to speak again in the afternoon, and I had no more confidence to stand up and speak because I did know how to represent this God again. I didn't know how to stand up there and talk about the God who answers prayer and still leave that gap of saying, but you see, you, can, you have to. I didn't know how to represent him. I had to be educated or to learn again. So I, I stepped down. I said, I'm not speaking in the afternoon. Let somebody else take the session. Can I be taken back to the hotel? I want to rest. I got back to the hotel and locked my door and immediately got on my knees. I said, Lord, something's wrong. I've lost my peace and I've lost my confidence. Please speak to me. Guide me. Let me know my position and how I'm supposed to stand in it. And immediately, without much uh, like pleading or waiting, the Lord dropped a scripture very powerfully. I knew it was him in my spirit. And I want to read that scripture. It's in the book of Luke, chapter 11, from verse 9. And it is Jesus Christ who was teaching on prayer. It starts, So I say to, to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And whoever seeks, will find. And to whom, to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now that was powerful. It exploded everything that had been built up in my mind. It was like almost like a rebuke. That how can you even allow yourself to believe what you just heard this morning? How can you believe that that's the character of God? That is misrepresenting the character of God. God is more eager to give than we are to give to our own children. And yet we don't find it hard to believe that we will give to our children when they ask us. Unless we do not have what they ask, but if we have the bread they're asking for, there's no way we can turn around and put a stone in their hands. Or just think about your son asking for fish, and you turn and put a snake in his hands. It's inconceivable. You can't even imagine it. Even for a joke, it would be a bad joke. And yet we believe this is the father that we serve. We are comfortable with that notion of the father. And therefore, we go on year after year praying and still holding that kind of attitude. Beloved, I knew something was wrong with the attitude of the old man, and yet I, I could not explain the truth or the fact that there's so much prayer going on all over the world today for years and years and years that has got nothing to show for results. So here I was with a picture of the Father. I was so convinced, delighted to answer prayer. And I was so convinced he's faithful, more faithful than men. And yet, on the other hand, I'm confronted with this picture of thousands of people worldwide who can stand up and be counted among those who say, we have prayed, we have waited, we have believed, and yet... It has not happened. So that led me on a course to seek understanding. And many, many times in my times of prayer, especially in seasons of fasting, I would come to the Lord and say, Lord, 
there must be an answer somewhere. I don't, I don't have it. I don't have an explanation. But there must be an answer somewhere. And when the Lord eventually began to open my understanding, he went straight to that very scripture the lady said she hated. Second Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I had used this scripture so many, many times, especially when I wanted to recruit people to commit themselves to prayer. I would use it when I'm teaching people to trust the Lord and also how to learn how to pray and have the right attitude towards God. And all the time I had used that scripture, I majored on the four points that God required of man. Humble yourself, pray, seek his face, and forsake your wicked ways. And I would teach, I would take sessions to teach on each of those four requirements. I never taught on the last ones where God says, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal the land. I did not teach on that because that was not my or our responsibility. That was God's responsibility. He's faithful. He will do what he says he will do. So we don't have to teach on how God hears, how he forgives, or how he heals the land. So I majored on saying, if only we can do what we are supposed to do, then God will do what he says he will do. And that looked fair enough. Then as I continued seeking the Lord, I felt the Holy Spirit asking me to focus on the last part of this verse. And I thought, that's interesting. When I went back, opened my Bible, although I knew the scripture by heart, I opened my Bible and began to read. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and forsake their wicked ways, then, and that word caught my attention, then, I said, Lord, this means you are putting a condition to your hearing. He's saying, then will I hear. Does that mean there are times we pray and you don't hear? Are there times we seek and pray and lay things before you, but you don't hear? It, the, the very suggestion of it uh, felt absurd to me. He's the God who sees everything and hears everything. He is even the whispers and even the words of our hearts, which we have not spoken out. How then could he be a God who doesn't hear? And to me, it was totally unacceptable even to think of God not hearing. Then my heart, my mind was taken to Isaiah 59, where it says, let me read it. Isaiah 59 from verse 1. Verse 1 and 2, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And that blew my mind. I said, my God, it's not because you cannot hear, it's you have chosen not to hear. His arm is not too short. It's almost like God is saying, don't think I cannot bring revival. Don't think I cannot change your society. Don't think my arm is too short or things are too difficult for me. And don't even think that I have not heard. Don't think that you, I'm not able to hear you. I've, I've heard your cries. I've heard your pleas. I've heard your fastings. But something is holding me back. Something is keeping me from responding the way you were, you're asking me to respond. It says your iniquities have separated you from your God. There's a gap. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not 
here. I immediately began to seek, seek him with fasting for a number of days just to understand, Lord, what exactly do you mean? And I came across this other scripture. There are so many uh, scriptures, but I'm just going to try and move on. I came up across this scripture in the New Testament. Very powerful scripture. The New Testament has got some of those promises I call extravagant. Jesus just says, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. It's almost like he's saying, there's no, there's no room for doubt. There's no room for, he says, abide in me. And my words abide in you. And ask whatever you want. It shall be given. Such promises that will leave no room for saying, God, God may not do it. But there is this one. John, writing in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And he says, this is the confidence we have. That if we ask anything according to the will of God, we are sure he hears. And if he hears, we therefore have what we've asked for. Now that's confidence. It's not, it's not leaving any room to say maybe we don't know whether he will do it to us or to our children or to our children's children. No, he says this is our confidence. It's our confidence. We only have to make sure we're asking according to the will of God. If we ask according to the will of God, he will hear us. That means he may choose not to hear us if we do not ask according to his will. Now, that makes sense. But then if he, if, if he hears us, no question, we have received what we are asking for. I wanted so much to get into that depth of prayer where I'm sure, I can walk away sure that I have been heard. And I'll not go into detail, but I read lives of men like Charles Finney. And how he came into the anointing of revival and the Spirit of God came upon him. There was this, this, there was this group of people who used to pray every Thursday, praying for revival to come. And they had been praying for years. But the revival was not coming. And Charles Finney was not a Christian. He came and joined them. He would join their prayer meetings every time and listen to their prayers and watch and see. And one day they asked him, would you like us to pray for you to become a Christian? He says, no, no thank you. Say, what, what do you mean you don't want to pray? Can we pray that God will make you willing? He says, no. And they, they just couldn't understand him. Then he asked them, I've listened to your prayers. Every week you are asking God to pour out his Holy Spirit. Because you need him, you want him, you want God to do it for you. And he has not answered you. Why would he answer prayers you make for me? If he cannot answer prayers you make for yourselves. If your prayers do not work for you, why should they work for me? And then he said another thing. I have listened to you praying, and there is no sense of expectancy in your prayers. And when you walk out of this room, there is no lifestyle that seems to be waiting for the answer of prayer. Not even in your words as you speak to one another is there any indication you are waiting for the answer to your prayers. In others, Charles was saying to them, it, it's just like a routine. You pray and you, you feel good about praying, but there's no expectancy in your prayers. Now think about the other old man in Colombia who said to me, he will do it when he wants. He's not expecting it. He's not making ready for it. He's not paying any price or preparing the way. He's saying, Lord, as long as I, I talk to you, the rest is yours. And if it's not happening, you are the one to blame. It's not me. I've done my part. Well, what causes us to pray, even quote scripture, and still not pray in the will of God? Because many people cannot explain when you say we are not, if you pray according to the will of God, you are sure he hears. He says, but we pray according to the will of God. We speak the word, we quote the word, we put it in our prayers. How can you say we are not praying according to the will of God? 
Again, as I asked these questions of God, he took me back to that scripture. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and forsake their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I will heal their land. And suddenly the Lord put my attention on the last part. I will heal the land. If God says I will heal the land, it means something is wrong with the land. The land is not in the right state it should be in according to God's plan. The land has been defiled. The land has been made rotten. The land has gone bad. And that could mean a lot of things. It could be the land, the air, the water, the ecological system. And I, and I began to think about that. And then the Lord took me again to Ezekiel 22. Where, verse 30, where God says, and I looked for a man among them who would rebuild the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I may not destroy it, but I found none. And I had used this scripture too many, many times to mobilize prayer and to encourage people to make a commitment to pray for the land. But this time the Lord put the emphasis on this very small phrase. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall. And God stopped it there. And I felt the Lord wanted me just to focus on that. It led me in a long journey of going back to study what is the wall. I went into Nehemiah. I looked at the wall, how they told him the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burnt. And that alone led him to sit down, grieve, cry, mourn, fast, refuse to do anything else. He was grieving and I thought, what was so important with the wall and the gates? So I went to study the walls and the wall is of course for the protection of the people of the, in the city. The gates are to decide what comes in and what comes out so that not everything pours in. You, you are able to say, no, we don't want that. You close the gates. You are able to, to discern what you want to come in, what you want to go, come out. But again, the gates were places where the wise men sat where wise counsel from God would be released unto the people, the gates were places where the judges sat. And they brought justice according to the word of the Lord, the law of the Lord. Gates were places the prophets would stand and prophesy to the city. And gates were places where people would come for arbitration. Gates were so important that many times we talk about gatekeepers, but we forget the wall. A gate is no use if the wall is broken down. That made sense. But then I came back to Ezekiel 22. And I decided to read it from verse 1 to the end. And I was surprised to find nowhere in this chapter is God talking about a physical wall. He's not talking about any physical wall. He's not even mentioning the word wall from verse 1 until verse 30 where he says, I look for a man among them who would build up the wall. So what does this mean? That's when I began to realize God is talking about a spiritual wall. A hedge. Like in the story of Job, God said to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? A righteous man, holy and blameless. And the enemy said, is he righteous for nothing? Haven't you built a hedge around him and around his household and around everything that he owns that nobody can touch him? And I remembered in Joshua, God said to Joshua, this book should never depart from you. Meditate on it, read it, obey, it. take the word. The word will protect you. The word will cause you to fulfill that which I've called you for. The word is going to form a kind of protection around Joshua. So I understood that to be okay. The word of God is like a wall around us. When we keep the word of God and live according to the word of God, meditate on the word of God and walk in the word of God, it forms a wall around us. Okay, if we can leave that there, 
and come back to Ezekiel 22. And you read from verse 1 to the end. God is not talking to the people. God is talking to the land. It says in chapter verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, will you judge her? Will you judge this city of bloodshed? Then confront her with all her detestable practices and say, this is what the Lord, the sovereign Lord says. He goes on and on. But if you read through, he's saying to the land, in you are people like this. In you are people who do this. Your princes have done this. He's not talking to the people, he's talking to the land. This very land, he's saying, I looked for a man among them who would stand on behalf of the land. So it's a land, and in verse 23, the Lord says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say to the land, You are a land that has got no rain or showers in the day of wrath. He's talking to the land and says, You don't have the blessing, you don't have the showers. You are a defiled land. And he says, There is a conspiracy, a conspiracy of her princes within her. And it goes on and on. God is talking to a land and to the land and telling the land, You are defiled. You are rotten. You are due for judgment. And do you know why you are the way you are? Because of the people in you and what they have done. He talks of the princes and says, See how they use their power to shed blood. He talks of the families and says, they, In you, they have taught children. To despise father and mother. In you they have treated strangers and orphans and widows uh, without justice. In you they have committed immorality. A man sleeping with another man's wife. Another one sleeps with his sister. And then he talks about the family broken down. And the moral standards broken. Then he goes into the financial area. In you they take and give briber, bribes. They Take usury and get unholy gain, excessive interest by extortion. They cheat one another. These are the people in you. They have forgotten me. I says, and I am going to strike the land. I'm going to bring judgment. Then he comes down here and says, in you, the princes are tearing people and devouring people, making so many widows. In you, the priests... Those who are supposed to speak my word and lead people in my ways and teach people to be holy, they have not put a distinction between the holy and the unholy. They have taught the people that there's no difference between the clean and the unclean. The officials in you, the public servants, are just exploiting the poor and making themselves rich. Your prophets are prophesying to them and blessing them and speaking lying divinations that this is what the sovereign Lord is saying when I've not spoken to them. And the people of the land are committing robbery and cheating and are mistreating the poor. This is the state. The people in you have brought the you, the land, to. And I looked among them to find one man who would rebuild the wall. And suddenly, oh, it opened up. If the wall of the Lord is the word of the Lord, the standards of the Lord, the, the precepts, the statutes of the Lord, the, the way God wants things to be, and if we say that is what will keep us, if that's the wall that will give us protection, all these people in the land who are doing the things they are doing have departed from the word, have departed from the standard of the Lord. So what is happening? You cannot depart from the standard of the Lord unless you do it in your mind first. So they have developed a mindset different from the mindset of God. The thought, their thoughts are not the thoughts of God. And their ways are not the ways of God. But they feel comfortable in their ways. They feel acceptable in their ways. And they, they affirm each other in their ways because they think alike. Even when it comes to the things of God, the priests and the prophets speak the word, take the word, preach the word, prophesy 
to strengthen the position where the people are. They make it acceptable. They make it understandable. And they interpret the word in such a way as to support the system as it is among the people. Now, find those people and tell them to pray for revival. Even if they want revival so much, their understanding of God is already distorted. Their understanding of the Spirit of God and what he would do if he comes is distorted. Not only are they comfortable and not in their ways and not wanting to change, they have theology teaching them to be comfortable and to love it that way. In other words, they are saying to God, come and bless this lifestyle that we have. Come and be part of the party. And does God want to answer that kind of prayer? No. Are they praying in the will of God? They may quote the word, but they are not praying the heart of God. The heart of God is different from their hearts. The passion of his heart is different from their passion. What God understands as proper, right, and good is not what they understand. They end up calling good evil or calling evil good. Even if they quote the scripture, they are not praying the will of God. Are you? As we go on, I just want to ask you to start thinking about how many times we take the word and we pray, but what we are asking is totally different from what God would desire to give us. And if, we, and if that goes on and we're not praying the will of God, we could pray for a decade, two, three, or four, and still have no answers to our prayers. If, what the Lord was teaching me is that the sickness of the land is in the people of the land. So if the land is defiled and needs healing, the issue is with the people. And if the people are the ones and they have got used to this lifestyle and the mindset, it means they have devised ways of life which are not the ways of God. They have each gone into their ways. And it's so easy to be in these ways and think you're serving the Lord. Jesus said to the apostles, they will cast you out of the synagogues thinking they are serving God. But they, they, they will do that because they don't know him. They want to serve him. They want to be good to him. But they don't have that intimate knowledge of God and relationship with him even to know his will. They are walking in the ways of the world. And therefore they cannot discern the will of the Father. Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you, brethren, to lay down your lives as a living sacrifice. It says, be ye not conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to discern the will of God. That means the will of God is not something you just stumble upon. You need to draw away from the world to the word of God and eventually to be able to discern as you determine I'm not going to go to the according to the thought pattern of the world. Hallelujah. I asked myself a question. If that is my mindset and I'm part of the sickness of the land, it means my ways are not the ways of God. And now I can understand why God is saying if my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Remember what he says, your sins have turned my face away that I will not hear. So in other words, begin to ask God, what has caused you to turn your face away from us? Why is it we cry, you do not answer? Why is it we seek, you do not answer? Do you remember Isaiah 58? You are fasting and praying. You think I'm going to hear you because of your fasting? Is this the fasting that I called for? God is saying, I am hearing you. I'm seeing you. But do you think I'm going to accept that? Then God begins to give his own standard. He says, this is what I require. So God is saying, seek my face. Ask yourself, why has God turned away? 
And then when you discover that his ways are different from your ways, forsake your wicked ways. Then I will hear. Then I will forgive whatever you've done. And then I will begin the healing of the land. I asked myself a question. But God, why don't you just answer prayer? Pour out your spirit. Then your spirit will draw people back to you. And the answer I got in my heart was, if God left us in this distorted understanding of his ways, and we just pray and say, pour out, pour out, pour out, and he pours out, he would in effect be stamping approval on our ways of life. He would not be drawing us to himself. He would be losing us. Because that will be evidence even God honors the way we live. Even God blessed us. If we are not pleasing to God, why would he pour out his spirit? So in his love, he holds back. He holds back the answer. Not to punish us, but to draw us into deeper hunger and thirst. And to cause us to begin to ask questions. Why is God not answering when he promised so clearly that he is going to answer? And that is the beginning of desperation. That's when we begin to feel desperate. So God promises us. He says, I'm not going to answer, but I want to give you assurance. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. God is saying, I'm not denying you. But I'm I'm saying, let me quote you another, another, another scripture. Genesis chapter 4. When God took the sacrifice of Abel and rejected the one of Cain, and Cain was angry. And God came to him and said, Cain, why are you angry? When you do right, won't you be accepted? In other words, God is saying, I'm not going to accept you simply because you've made an offering. Unless you do it right. But when you, when you do it right, I will come to you. In the same way, God is saying, my hand is not too short that I cannot save. My ear is not closed. But there are conditions I just can't be part of. If you do it right, then I will join myself to you. I'll remove the gap between us. So God is assuring us that he has a plan for us. The plan is good. The plan is not for failure. The plan is for hope and to bring us to the desired end. And he wants us to pray. And he promises he will answer prayer. He will hear prayer. But the condition is, seek me. If you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found of you. Seek me with all of your heart, and I will be found of you. So that's where we come to the place of the desperate prayer. Not desperate in terms of saying I'm all torn up and I'm giving up. That desperation of saying, God, why? How long, Lord? How long will you hold back when this is going on? So what do we need to do to bring about desperation? First of all, we have to recognize what hinders desperation in our hearts. And then also find out what will bring this desperation to us. And as we discover these things, we have to come to the place of being totally, totally convinced that the status quo can no longer be accepted. If in our minds we still think we can survive with the status quo, we can make do with the status quo, desperation will remain far from us. Until we get to that place where we feel Things cannot continue like this. Change must come. We have asked God for change. Change is not coming. But things remaining the same is not an option. Things must change. That's when we begin to feel, God, why, why aren't you answering? Is there something we are not doing right? 
Is there something we are not fulfilling? Are we missing something? Oh God, show us what you require of us. Even if it is a high cost, whatever the price, Lord, we will do it, Lord. But don't hide your face from us. Lord, look at the way we are. Lord, we cannot live like this anymore. We cannot go on like this, oh God. We need you. Father, if there's anything we are not doing right, anything we are not seeing, please show it to us, but do not deny us. Do not hide away from us. Not another day, oh God, desperation begins. Because you've come to the place of saying, I can't take it like this anymore. I can't live like this. And, but if we have that mind which thinks, okay, if it doesn't come, we will continue doing what we are doing, and waiting. Maybe he will do it to our children. Maybe to our children's children. Then you cannot get desperate. Because you are comfortable with the status quo. I'll give you examples. In the days of Idi Amin, in my country, Uganda, everybody knew Idi Amin is invincible. Nobody even imagined that he could be removed. So our mindset was not the mindset of God. We thought this is an impossible thing. We thought this is a man that is beyond anything. When he said, no more church, everybody obeyed that. When he says, no more this, everybody obeyed that. Our mindset was not of God. And that kept us in a certain position. But time came when the abuse was so deep, so great, that people began to feel, how much longer can we continue this way? And then almost every family was losing a loved one. And fear was gripping the country. And then the last thing we had, our faith, was torn away from us. The freedom to seek God, to pray, and at least find comfort and solace in God was taken away. And our nation was declared Islamic. Our church buildings were declared out of bounds. And so people turned to the homes to pray in the homes. They turned to pray in small groups here and there. And then soldiers would start arresting them. Soldiers would come and raid homes because people are praying. In other words, it was becoming unbearable. And it was at that place, at that moment, the spirit of desperation took over. Where people say, Lord, we cannot live like this. Lord, have you forgotten us? Do you exist? If you exist, you must come in, Lord. So it's, it's every day people would weigh. What can we do? It's too big for us. But can life go on like this? No, no way. We can't continue like this. Something must change. We don't know how to change it. America has gone. Britain has gone. Germany has gone. There's no one, no friend in sight. Only God. So desperation set in and we began to cry out. We began to cry out. And as you cry out, something begins to happen deep inside of you because you think, God, the way I understand you, you are a good God. I can't put two and two together. A good God and a bad situation you are not answering. Is there something we are missing? And God begins to open, up, open eyes and bring revelation. Yes, what about this? Remove this. Deal with this. And as God begins to bring that revelation, obedience sets in. You begin to deal with issues which are separating you with your God. You begin to see where your ways are differing from the ways of the Lord. And you begin to say, Lord, whatever it takes, if that's what you want, we will do it. So prayer begins to open the way for the Holy Spirit to move in. Hallelujah. I want to use another example in, this, in Fiji where they had this village where there was so many suicides and uh, there was all this chaos, drugs and everything. And th they lived with it. They accepted this is the way things are. This is the way things will go. Until it was building up to a certain point. Uh, the story goes where that young man hung himself and it was the council came together and says, this can't go on anymore. We've got to find an answer. We've got to get out of this situation. When the people reach a place of saying the status quo is not acceptable anymore, it's not an option, then we become desperate. And that's when they sent out to the team of healing of the land team to come, and the team gave them conditions. We cannot come unless you have A, B, C, D. They say, okay, we will do that, but we need you. 
When people get desperate, they pay the price. When people get desperate, they are willing to remove, to come out of their comfort zones. When people get desperate, they are willing to do things they would not do otherwise. But now because they have come to the place of saying, we can't continue this way, they are willing to make changes. And as the, the, the Bible says, draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh unto you. So when we begin to remove these barriers which create a gap between us and God, God begins to come towards us. And when he comes, we feel it and we know it. Now, I'll say this. In the West, it's much harder to create desperation. I have traveled a bit around Europe and America, and many times I've been asked the question, why should we be desperate in prayer? We don't have an Idi Amin for a dictator. We don't have insecurity to cry out and say, Lord, protect us. We have a good health care system. We don't have to be so desperate when we get sick. We have enough food. We don't have to cry out to God. I mean, why do you expect us to get desperate? We don't know how to be desperate. But you know the Jesus said about the days of the end times that there will be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot when they were selling and buying, marrying and giving in marriage, building and constructing. The end came upon them suddenly. In the West, there is an understanding that desperation only comes because of physical hardships. Just as it is in many parts of the world. And therefore there is a tendency to ignore the moral decay, the, er the er erosion of spiritual inheritance, the lives that are being broken, the marriages being torn apart, the young people whose lives are being broken, the drug addiction that is on the rise, the sex industry that is destroying the very res respect of man and everything that is tearing what God created man to be. What is increasingly happening in the West is not the will of God. And when it comes to the church, the church is losing territory every year. The world is making demands on the church. Now accept this. Now this is politically right. Now you can no longer talk like that. Now you cannot rebuke this. And in the church, more and more people are demanding to be accepted in their sinful ways and to live with them as godly ways. And we are learning to accommodate and be careful not to, not to hurt people's feelings or not to vex anybody. And then we say, Lord, pour out your revival. Pour out your spirit. But the mindset with which we are asking that is totally different from the mind of God. And God wouldn't answer that, otherwise he would be losing his people. He would rather hold back and say, why do you think I'm not answering your prayer? Why don't you seek me with all of your heart, then I will reveal to you my ways. And today we are getting abominable things that were unheard of, being pushed into the church, and the church is beginning to accept them, endorse them, even bring them in the pulpit. And with that kind of mindset, we are asking for God to bring his outpouring. But again, we wonder why we don't have desperation. Do you know why we don't have desperation? Because we have learned to be comfortable in that situation. We, learn, we have learned to love it. As much as we are asking God to pour out his spirit, we don't imagine in our hearts that when the spirit comes, all this must go out. It's the very thing we love. And people tell you, I can't give this up. I can't make the time to pray. I can't go on that way the way you, you are talking about. But that's what you're asking for. In others, you are telling God, come, but I will not allow you to do with, with my life what you will come to do. That's a prayer that will never be answered. I can't pray. I can't spend an hour in prayer. It just can't happen. You see, with the system and the way we work here, what do you mean? When the Spirit comes, you will have to spend time with him. But if there's no even willingness to consider, then it means he's self-defeatist. 
And the problem, the biggest problem is, because we are losing territory spiritually, moral decay is coming in like a flood, and people are demanding that they be accepted as they are, and their ways as they are in church. Therefore, we change our theology. We, we create teachings that can make people comfortable and not disrupt them. So that they, they can still come. We have the numbers. But if we don't have the change for the kingdom, Jesus said, the kingdom does not come manifest. The kingdom starts in the heart. So if it's not there in the heart, we can have a wonderful gathering. But maybe it's not the kingdom of God. And if we are not willing to preach to make it, we are afraid to make people uncomfortable. I've been to places where the word was preached. I, I poured out my heart and the Lord blessed the anointing of God, came down, the Holy Spirit came and the spirit of conviction fell upon the people. And people began to weep and to cry and to see themselves what they are. Then the pastor or some other minister would stand up and say, Hallelujah. We have to live here with rejoicing and dance to the Lord because it's all done. And so they tell the worship team to come and sing a song or saying, or dancing. And that's one of the surest ways of quenching the spirit. Then how can there be genuine repentance if the spirit of conviction is not allowed to do the work it's supposed to do? It can't happen. How can there be desperation in prayer if we're not even allowed to see the state in which we are. And another problem, if, if we are continuing to teach everything is okay, everything is okay when the church is dying, it means we, we are unconsciously building a mindset in the people which says we are fine and God is happy with the way things are. The people think they are fine in a dying state. That's what the Bible says. They have healed the wounds of my people on the surface, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Those people have not only been deceived, they have been robbed of the opportunity to cry out to God. They don't even have the conviction. They don't even have the ability to realize something's wrong because they've been taught something different. And God have mercy upon all of us who are called to the ministry of handling the word of God, teaching it to others. If we are going to close the door to people seeking God. God says, if they were my prophets and they stood before me, they would have heard my heart and I would have said to my people, repent. That means something is also wrong in the pulpit. And these are things that are not, not normally easy to talk about, but if we are really going to bring desperation to the church, we need to address some of these issues. I want to find a way of bringing this to an end. If we're going to bring desperation, we must focus and intend to really create this desperation. We cannot hope it will just come by itself. Very quickly, I'll mention some of the things that can bring this desperation. One, if we, if we can bring stories of what God is doing to other people who are desperately seeking him, stories of God transforming communities, revival falling when people cry out. And we realize if God is doing it there, God can do, can do it here. In others, let's create that hunger and jealousy that Paul said, I, I serve the Gentiles so much to make my people jealous. Let's share the stories of what God is doing in goodness to other people to create that jealousy and that feeling, oh God, we also want it. Two, we must begin to show that God is higher, bigger, and more able than we have made him out. We must lift the standard higher. We must show the power. We must show the love, the goodness. This notion of saying God can do it 40 years later. It's unacceptable when our children are being destroyed. When our marriages are being torn apart. We've got to demand change today. And we've got to show and build the faith that God is able to do that today. And if people can be convinced that God can do it today, then they will say, Lord, why aren't you doing it then? 
And when people begin to ask those questions, the heart begins to melt. Three, in places where theology has been created to make people comfortable in a dying state, we need to challenge the theology of the land. We need to challenge the ministry of the pulpit. We need to come to the place of not fearing to fall out of the, the general system, the general flow, but be able to say this is not the word of God. The word of God is different from what we have taught. And that may not make us very popular, but it's a choice we've got to make. We've got to challenge the theology that we are teaching. Lastly, we've got to expose the works of the devil. The Bible says the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. We've got to show the things around us are not just social problems, are not just psychological things, are not just sicknesses. They are works of the devil. And if they're works of the devil, to show that there is an answer to the works of the devil. Whatever he's doing in our bodies, in our families, in our lives, in our society, on our streets, these are manifest works of the devil. And we have to, to show that the church of Jesus Christ has got the authority and the power to deal with the works of the devil. God, Jesus said, I give you power to step over snakes and over scorpions and over every power of the devil and nothing shall do you any harm. In, the, in others, we need to start teaching people the enemy, the, the demonic world is real. It exists. Stop denying the spiritual realm and the demonic world. It's there. It's all around us. Two, we've got to show the church the work has been finished. The enemy is defeated. Demons have got no right to do what they are doing against us because Jesus has overcome them. We have the power. We've got to raise the faith of the people that they cannot, they shouldn't continue living the way they are living because they have got the power to change things. Then we've got to equip the people with the armor of the Lord, teaching them how to fight the, the fight of faith, to wage spiritual warfare, and to claim the victory of Jesus Christ. When people get there, then they will realize living under the status quo is depriving them of their inheritance. And when people realize that, then they will begin to reach out. I'll say very quickly, the benefits of desperation. When people become desperate, they are willing to pay the price. They will not stop and saying, Jesus did it for us. It's, we don't have to do anything. They realize there's something we can do. So they are willing to pay the price. The faith levels, number two, the faith levels will rise because they realize it's possible. It's possible. It's not an impossible situation we're dealing with. We are dealing with something we can change. So the faith levels will rise. Three, because people realize God can do it and is the only one who can do it, they will be willing to spend time in his presence. This business of saying I can't pray goes away because people realize my prayer makes a difference. I will abide in his presence. The Bible says those who wait upon the Lord will have their strength renewed. While others are falling and fainting, they will soar high like eagles. So people will start spending time before God because of the desperation. And they will know God can do it. I just want to st stick in there for just another day and believe God to answer prayer. Three, four. When people abide in the presence of the Lord and seek him and cry, their lives are changing. They are coming away from their wicked ways. They are aligning themselves with the word of God. Their revelation is becoming sharper, deeper, and clearer. They are beginning to see the kingdom of God as it really should be. And they are beginning to move away from the world into the ways of the, of the Lord. They are surrendering, surrendering to the Lord. And when they do that, the anointing and the presence of God abides with them. So that when they walk out into the streets, they're not just walking by themselves, they're carrying the anointing of God, the presence of God, and that's what really makes a difference, the presence. And when they come together, the presence thickens. And when they pray and worship and begin to reach out for the society, it's like releasing this wave into society. We are releasing this power into society. It begins to make a difference. And lastly, because we surrender in the presence of God, 
because we realize this is not the way of God and we give it up, we begin to learn his ways, learn his principles, and we know that if you're going to keep this presence, we've got to keep to his principles. So when we go out and talk to our people, we can begin to teach the principles of God and to show people the ways of God and to call people to repent, come out of the ways of the world into the ways of the Lord. It's possible to have desperation anywhere in the world. It's not limited to physical hardships. It can happen even where there is affluence and ease. We only have to return to the ways of the Lord. Let's not assume and accept this position that God will answer 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, in, in the future. If he's answering prayer by people spending even two weeks as a community fasting and praying and cleaning up their lives, then God will answer the same if we also seek him. Let's get desperate because God is faithful. God bless you so much.